Shadi's a good friend of mine. Like, we're really good friends. Um, in fact, I helped him out a lot with, like, when he was trying to do, like, his own workshops and stuff. He was trying to ask for me some advice. He wasn't sure how to handle certain things. So I told him, like, this is kind of how you can do it. And uh, he took that advice and he ran with it and started his own stuff, uh, including creating, you know, one pixel brush. Um, and uh, I've heard this this complaint from students before where they're like, look, I listened to a talk from Shadi and he basically said, if you don't use DAS 3D or don't use any kind of like um, photo manipulating or uh, if you don't use any of these kind of um, new fingal techniques and strats, then you're just kind of falling behind the times. And there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, and, and let me explain why it's wrong, though. But then let me explain another angle. So there is a, a, another artist named Marco Dedruzhevic, which I'm sure you guys heard. Also, another really good artist, pretty good guy. Uh, I can't say that we're good friends. I don't know him well enough. But he did help uh, two of my students get jobs at his studio uh, via me introducing and then talking, right? So that's, that's great. But um, he also went on the, the thing of saying, you know, if you don't draw or paint, then I'm not going to hire you. And he is also right. So this is like a, a real hard conundrum that I can imagine a student have to deal with. These two powerhouses, uh, people who have uh, real, um, they have real uh, accountability, they have real evidence of their success, you know? So it's, it's hard to say, but who's right and who's wrong kind of thing, you know? And why I say they're both wrong is because they are. Because Marco exists and Shadi exists. You see what I'm saying? It's the whole Batman and Joker scene where there's the immovable uh, wall and the unstoppable force, right? They, they both exist. And and that's the point is that yeah Marco de Durjevic is exactly no this Mar Marco Durjevic no this I think it's de Durjevic there's a J in there I'm just pronouncing it incorrectly yes I'm sorry um, that's how I've been calling him for many years so the guy that owns six more vodka that guy and then the the guy who owns one pixel brush see so there's there's two samples that I'm trying to say that we can choose from, okay? And my my point about all this is that they both exist, you know? And there are artists who only paint. I mean, look at like the majority of artists who work at um, uh, Pixar or uh, animation studios in general, like almost all of them, right? Uh, or stylized studios like Riot and Blizzard. So how could that be true? And at the same time, you know, uh, you have companies like Infinity Ward or uh, Respawn who do want that photo bash look, or even Sony Santa Monica, where I used to live, or work. Okay? And they want, like, that new age 3D concept stuff. Or most films. So I always say pay attention to the context versus... Um, like this kind of over broad statement because if you if you pay attention to these like overly broad statements it can be very distracting and disconcerting i get that you know but trust that there is an example for for all cases so for instance i'm getting into like game design and i'm making pixel art i've chose i've basically decided i want to make action games or games that have mostly action in them and then focus on 2D art specifically. Uh, start with pixel art and then move up to maybe more advanced styles. But but this art, 2D art, right? And so then when I end up doing that, I you know I could easily like, well, there how many games are pixel art? There's not so many games. Like they don't make a lot of money. Like where's that about? Like how am I going to make a sustainable living doing that? Um, because I'm smart. That's how I know that I don't need to sell to millions. I just need to sell, sell to tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands. I can, it's, it's 
completely in my range to sell to 100,000 people my game than it is to sell millions. I get that. And it's not about making one game that just pays all my bills. I'm like, it's not about making Minecraft. It's about continuously making games that I enjoy, that I myself love to play, and reaching the people that also enjoy playing those types of games. And so what I've done is researched as many games as I possibly can that exist in this realm and see how they do it. And the best strategy for me to monetarily sustain myself is to basically keep myself as a very small team, only hire contractors to do things that I don't know how to do, or just learn how to do them and just take my time. Um, and in that way, if you think about it, think about the math there. If I sell my game for $5 and I make one game and it sells 100,000 copies for $5, that's $500,000 that goes all to me. That is completely sustainable living. Even if it sold half of that, that's $250,000. If it sold a quarter of that, it would be $125,000. That $125,000, you know, that would be uh, uh, that would be like a, yeah, 125,000 uh, copies. Or no, no, what's the math there? It would be like, it would be very, it wouldn't be as many as I just said before, but it would what are you looking for, Sudi? I don't know, Sudi. Um, it wouldn't be as much as before, um, but it would be enough to, let's say, fuel me for the next several months to work on my next game and then put that out there. And then if that makes just as much, if not more, then I can keep working. Sustainability is what I'm about, right? I'm not about uh, uh, cashing in. I've tried this types of approach before, and it just isn't sustainable. It just isn't. So what's the best strategy is building a sustainable model that works. And I always tell people this, too, because a lot of you guys get really confused. Like, where should I work? What should I do? What's the best tactic? And I say, pick something that you enjoy, because then instead of it becoming your career, it will become your vocation. And vocation means that it's something that you enjoy to do, something you'll do even if you don't get paid for doing it. And the people who get paid the most and the most handsomely usually do the things that they love. Okay? Okay, so let's go through what some people were saying. Eric had a question. Jack said, uh, what, what your goals are dictate uh, how you should go about achieving them. Yeah, so... Don't get me wrong, though. Like, I think you should try every little thing, you know. Try it, but get back to task as soon as possible. You know, don't get, don't get distracted, y'all. All right, but Eric had a question. Go ahead. You can go and ask first. All right, hello? Hey, what's up, buddy? So, uh, actually, I actually have two questions, but one of them is really quick. You could probably answer it in, like, two seconds. Um, okay. Uh, I noticed that you can switch from like a really dark value to a midtone to a bright value really quick. How do you uh -huh. do that? Is there like a command for that? Uh, what, what do you What do you mean specifically? Like like when you're doing your thumbs, you uh -huh. uh, you have like a dark black, and then you go quickly to a, a midtone. Oh, I see. Uh, no, I just like I will paint a midtone and color pick it immediately. Um, so the default oh, oh. settings in Photoshop is D takes you to black and white. Uh, black is now in our foreground, and the white is our background. And if I press X, it, it flips it, All right? Oh, I and then so then when I want like a gray, I just take this tone and then bam, immediately pick it. Gotcha. Okay, and then um, the second question I had was I was trying to draw a face yesterday, right? And I realized that I draw really crooked when I'm trying to do something symmetrical, and I think that's a, like a, um, a common thing with artists. I was just wondering if you could uh, give me some insight on drawing proportional faces, or yeah, you know, um, the way that I would answer this question might not be ideal, right? Because it seems like what you're referring to is a mechanical problem. Okay, so what do I mean by, by mechanical? Um, it's the type of problem 
like you know i always say you should practice right like that's like a common theme yeah. throughout my courses uh and i usually try to give as much insight about what and how you can go about practicing and i usually get into philosophy right of like the thinking and perspective of why you might be distracted or why you might not be uh effective you know so I usually get into all that stuff because I say, yeah, you know, practice is important, but this is what you should consider, right? Uh, as an example, like earlier when we were, we were talking with Maya, like I gave her many examples of what I meant by clarity, but at the end of the day, I told her she just needed to practice it, right? Yeah. Here's the many tools, like you should do this, you try that, think of it like this way. And then I even explained to her potentially psychologically what might be going on you know, to help her kind of get past any kind of psychological barriers that she might not have been aware of before that I just brought to her attention, you know? Not yeah. to speak about Maya. I'm just using that as an example. Like, those, like the things that uh, I was trying to address with her are much more complicated, right? And so this, you need to get a little bit more complicated um, insight. But what you're referring to is, is one of the types of things that generally is like practice makes perfect. Okay. Okay. Like if you're drawing, it's a it's a mechanical problem. It's like it's the same thing as like, can you draw a circle? We don't have to go into philosophy about how to draw circles for you to practice how to draw circles. Just go and do it, right? It's it's gotcha. it's there's nothing yeah. to it. <laughs> you just got to go do it. You know, yeah. it's it's the reason why you have a hard time drawing crooked faces is because you're just not trying to not draw them crooked <laughs> and so you got to start practicing that and um okay. and it's it's mechanical and i think there's there's some tools right but again it's still like you have to practice it like you can probably try to draw shapes right i was using and... sketch sketchbook where that you can like use the symmetry line no 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 don't do that like like just <laughs> just just actually like try to draw a shape that is okay. relatively symmetrical and the best way to find out is flip the canvas and does it yeah, still yeah, feel I do that constantly? And it's yeah. so frustrating. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank but you like, for your... uh, yeah, but that's the kind of thing that's like, I, there's no philosophy, uh, philosophy behind something like that. Like you just, it, it, it's like the same thing about like if I were to tell you to get stronger weight training, you know, like yes, there's some good advice about like stink, sticking with compound movements and like you know, uh, good nutrition and rest, right? But at the end of the day, you got to move weight up and then bring it back down, <laughs> okay? You know, and and you gotta you gotta do it. And if you don't, you know, you're not gonna get stronger. And and there's some things that you just like, like just a push-up's a push-up, man. There's like, there's some form like you know, some people like the form police will come and tell you like, ah, oh, you know, you gotta do this. But I, I, in my experience, I've helped people like get better at push-ups. They just got to just do them. And I think good form just naturally comes because it, yeah, it just really gets stronger. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the reason why they have bad form is they just don't have strong core or they don't have a good, um, uh, they don't have good practice with it, you know? Right. I'm um, loving the gym analogies. Thank you. Yeah. Just so you can have something to relate with. And yeah. so, uh, so keep that in mind. That's what I'm trying to say. Like, this is the same. It's like, if you're having uh, if you're having drawing problems, I feel bad for you, son. I got <laughs> nine, nine problems, but drawing a lot is not one. Okay, and so <laughs> and so hopefully you get that and you can just get to it. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot. I'll talk to you later. Bye. All right. So there was another question I saw. Oh, let's see what's up. Uh, I think it was. Maya, I have some questions. Do you have any news other than sites uh, you follow regularly, podcasts? Uh, yeah, I, I follow it, – it all depends on what I'm into, right? So, for instance, I'm really into programming right now. So if you go to, like, my YouTube channel, like, it's, like, mostly, like, JavaScript and, like, CSS and Node.js and Electron and all these things you probably have no idea what the hell I'm talking about. Um, uh, that I watch. I like to watch Crash Course, their YouTube channel. They have a lot of really insightful information. Um, and the, the type of stuff that's not uh, educational, like I, I've started to follow uh, PewDiePie, for instance. Like, uh, he, he's a silly dude, and he makes me laugh. Um, and I think his his content has changed over the years from, like, being this really stupid 
gamer dude online to now like tr- being a really stupid comedian like he's trying to be like a straight up comedian make jokes and stuff while playing games which is really cool i'm actually uh i'm i'm really interested in what he's doing and what he's he's what's happening because he's a good uh model example of what it's like to be successful because of what you say and do in your everyday life and how that psychologically affects people is if your career is built around you being a character uh and continuously and constantly how does that affect you psychologically right it's really interesting and this is a really interesting time where you can witness that you see this happening uh time and time again from celebrities like this type of information starting to be more more transparent and it's cool like this this morning i just saw a video of him like i guess i missed another video and he was talking about how he was trying to do all the stuff that makes a person successful on paper but it just was killing him inside type of thing and it's just like it's like I know a lot of people might watch that and have no idea what he's talking about. I'm like, well, you make millions of dollars, dude. Get your act together. It's like, stop crying. Um, but like, I, as someone who started his own business, tried to do his own thing, uh, I'm like, I get it, dude. I get, I understand 100 percent what he's talking about, man. You know, that's why I like my desk is like a. I have only one desk, one monitor. I work in my bedroom, you know, because I try to escape from all these crazy. Uh, responsibilities that I was putting onto myself for no real reason other than that's what you're supposed to do when you have a business, right? And so um, those bad choices, like uh, what I prefer to do is what, what I'm doing now, teach and draw weird shit, all right? And now uh, learning how to code, like I'm, I like to learn new stuff and I'm learning how to code and I'm sticking with it. Um, I think I'm going to give myself like a, a few years, but I'm going to really challenge myself and I'm going to try to create tools for artists that are really amazing um, because I, I can now, you know, I can't just, I, I don't need to speculate about like what could be improved in different tools and software. I can make them now. Uh, it'll take me some time. It'll be very fucking hard, but I can do it. Y'all, you know? And so uh, I like watching channels like that, like a really, really popular uh, YouTubers and streamers uh, just to see this, just, just how, they succeed over time. I'm very patient. I'm paying attention. There's some streamers that I watch what they do, and I get it. They they fucking nailed it. For instance, someone like uh, Philip DeFranco, I think he has a really good handle on his thing. He's been it through it all. Like he went up and down, like through his career. So it's really good to see kind of how he handles it. And you can tell. You can tell he's a lot wiser, right? Like he's not, um, like he's not as uh, naive as he once was. He's much, much wiser. And it's really interesting to see how some people surface and do okay over time and uh, others uh, are falling apart and like losing themselves. And I'm trying to pay attention to that because that can easily happen to myself and to any, many others. So I want to like, give fair warning to my students and other people that are getting in that position. Yeah, one of my students, for instance, he's got like this really good project going and he's getting hit up by Hollywood executives and they're like, you know, they're, they're trying to throw money at him. And I said, don't take any of their money. And he's like, oh, but it's a lot of money, bro. And I'm like, no, nah. it's like, as soon as you do that, you'll have what I call the golden shackles, right? Meaning that you got paid, but now you are a servant to those who gave you that money. And you have to understand that when you made that project, they came to you and you were doing it for free for yourself, right? He's like, hold on to that as long as you humanly can. And then one day, uh, you'll see what I'm talking about. You'll see the value increase. Uh, and it, it might take a long time, but it's, it's, it's from what I've observed, um, it's a really valuable thing to try to do. Like have some hindsight to try to stay, stay in it for the long haul, not for the short burst of cash. Uh, even if it's a lot, even if it's like in the millions, it's like yeah, millions goes faster than you think, man. Trust me. And so... And he was just like, all right, I'll consider that. Because he takes my insight pretty seriously, so he, he was pretty earnest about it. But we'll see. A lot of money, man, makes people react to anything, re- react really strangely. And let me be clear, I've never made millions of dollars. <laughs> but I've made a lot of money, man, on, on different projects. And I'm very happy that I made as much money as I did. Because even though I could have probably made more or I could continuously make more money if I really – 
went back to that industry, um, I learned like a lot of hard lessons and those hard lessons carried with me into the kind of ideals that I have today. So I, I generally, uh, I generally, uh, I'm thankful that I've never broke rich just yet. Right, I've had a lot of life happen to me, so I'm a little bit more humble. It doesn't mean that I'm impervious to any kind of serious damage, but it's just it's just nice. So yeah, I watch those types of podcasts, and I watch like Big Think. I watch educational ones, things that are progressive um, to my growth. Uh, YouTube channels like that, but I, it's, like I said, it's all context. Depends on what I'm into. What's my flavor of the week or the month or the year looking like? Uh, you'll you'll see a very clear trend in my um, YouTube followage. And then question: Do you have much fun programming slash learning program versus art? Okay, this is a great question, Maya. And I'm going to tell you guys right now: I enjoy programming way more than I do making art. I know, right? What? And here's the irony. I went to school originally as a programmer because I had no art skill, right? Because I was like, I want to make video games. I like, I love video games. And when I saw people draw, I was like, that is way more creative and cool because I was, I was also a musician when I was in high school. You know, I was in several bands that were mildly successful, at least locally. And so I had that like creative bone in my body, you know? And so I thought, that's where I want to be. I want to be in the creative space. And plus, I thought, you know, drawing monsters and characters, that's like a really cool thing. And it is. And I actually love the job and career that I grew. I really do. But as I'm learning programming, never have I had the feeling of like, just like high-fiving myself when I solve like a really hard problem that I couldn't figure it out. It's just like such so rewarding it is like god how do i make this thing move okay i got it to move but it's like now this is broken ah god damn it like this is not and that and this and everything just doesn't make sense and everything falling apart what in the world's happening right but like once you figure it out you're like oh, of course i see the face of god i see the language of the gods <laughs> <laughs> and you just start to really uh, start to understand stuff, man. And um, it's really, really empowering. For instance, like my appreciation for Photoshop skyrocketed once I just learned just simple math on how to make something do something visual, right? And I was like, whoa, man, this is, this is intense. And I was like, oh my God, like Photoshop, dude, is a masterpiece of software engineering. And that's why it's a standard. That's why people keep using this mother effer. Like that's why nobody else can catch up just yet. There's some softwares that do cool things and they're more artistically inclined, like painterly inclined, right? Like they have the symmetry tool, which uh, now with more insight, uh, no, yeah, Photoshop can totally do it. They're just fucking not doing it for whatever reason. There must be something going on in their API or in their back-end programming that will it will make it an extremely challenging feat to add symmetry. Or maybe they just don't see the value in it since um, most photographers don't really need to use symmetry in the way that artists do because uh, artists aren't the main, um, the main uh, support of their tool. We, there's a lot of us, but photographers are the ones, okay? And so, anyway, uh, yeah, like, it just, like, opened my eyes to all this stuff. I'm, like, way more uh, woke. <laughs> and and it's, it's the math. Like, think about it like this. There is an equation on how to draw a circle. Think about that. There's, a, there's a, an equation that you can write, and if you put in numbers into that equation, it will draw a perfect circle. And now you might say to yourself, oh yeah, that makes sense, right? But think about what that means then. That means that what we do, drawing, could all be programmed, right? Everything, 
Like the way that I draw drew this or painted this this thing can be replicated through a machine. It's just numbers and equations. It's just the numbers and equations that happen to be used while I'm doing this are just probably way more complex for a um, for a programmer to, to decipher. Or maybe the opposite, which is probably more true, the technology is not fast enough to process what a human brain can do. And I think that's actually the more true. I think people can actually programmatic, uh, program programmatically create an Anthony Jones but the processing power would be the problem, okay? It's not so much that they can't replicate me now, it's that there's not enough processing power to replicate me yet, which is freaking dope. So scary, but dope. <laughs> yeah, and don't worry, guys. This is this is far into the future. This is going to take a while. Like you guys, by the, by this time, if that technology exists, it will be the same time that we can probably turn our subconscious into a robotic body, which uh, sign me up. You know, our preconceived notions of being human are based off of our just subjective opinions. You don't know how dope it would be to be a robot until you become one. Yeah, I know. Uh, I actually think th think about that, uh, by the way, the teaching stuff. Like, I might end up uh, becoming uh, an, an instructor that can teach you to, to learn a lot of these different specialized things really well, or uh, become a really good generalist and make your own things, from art to music to games, you know, make your own projects and make your own money uh, so you don't have to work for other companies. You know? And I think that'll bring a lot more value to the to the robot pencil uh, world. That's what I'm doing right now. Like I made that, that program where you can make a shape and try to draw something inside that shape as an exercise. Um, within that same tool, I made a... Uh, So I made this tool, which is basically um, a still life room. Uh, one thing that I was going to do is start adding more and more things, like an urn and, uh, or a character pose in a certain way. And you just go in here, and you can change the color and try to do some studies in here. You know? What was that? Cone floating? And then you can change the scene and materials again. Right, um, there's more. And the object is just to teach you how to like, um, just paint certain shapes and forms, even if it's not 100% accurate, because it isn't the lighting, there's no reflection there. But it's helpful to just kind of practice this stuff. And then like you change the lighting. Right. All this is coded, figured out on this website, on my website. So yes, I do enjoy coding way, way more um, because of the fulfillment that I get from solving a problem because it's so hard. I, I, I akin it to actually like playing a video game. Uh, and I was watching a, a talk by John Romero, who's the guy who like, one of the people who pioneered like first person shooters, the guy who like made Doom and Quake and stuff like that. He um he wrote uh, this really cool quote where he said, you know, programming is a creative out outlet, but the tool for the cre the creative tool is actually logic. Right? So painters use paint brushes and Photoshop to um, or like paint and color and light and form. Actually, they're probably more akin to like painters use like light and color and form and design to determine their creative um, success. A programmer's is logic, logic and math, right? 
and it's really cool. And I, I even talk to my wife about it all the time. Like, I need to upgrade my brain because I don't know enough about math. Like, I'm pretty good at math, like basic arithmetic and basic algebra, but I need to get into some surface algebra and linear equations and like just kind of crazy uh, shape oriented math shape and form oriented math along with physical math like physics to like really to me it, it would be equivalent to when i had to learn anatomy and proportions for character designs that's the way i'm seeing it like it's not that interesting on the surface but it needs to be done if i want to be pro Anyway, any other questions? I think there was another one, right? Jack, have you ever had a student that only referenced your work and tried to emulate your exact style? Um, not really, but I did at the time had all my students paint exactly like me when I first did my mentorships. And that was a problem, so I got rid of that because I was basically creating a bunch of clones and the problem with that is that I already exist and I don't want I don't want people to necessarily be just like me not because I don't think that's a good tactic to to get work uh, I think it's it's bad for business for you because then um, if I don't replicate a certain style or, or concept then you're going to have a hard time conveying it on your own and so that's what was happening it was hard to like get my students to necessarily um, try something different uh, if I asked them to and uh, a good example of this that happened to myself is that when I was studying from people like Charlie Wen, I didn't study from him directly. It was indirect. Like I would look at his work and just learn from looking at it. And then one day, you know, I was trying to paint like a certain metal and I was looking online for any kind of work that he had online, you know, and uh, that painted like the specific type of metal. And I just couldn't find any examples, right? And because I couldn't find any examples, I basically was stuck. I was basically stuck on this assignment where I couldn't paint metal. And it, it came to it came very clear to me that the reason why I can't is because I don't, if, if Charlie doesn't do it, then I can't do it. And I didn't like that. I didn't like that idea that I, I had such a dependency. And so that's why I usually encourage students to avoid that same kind of dependency with artists that they admire uh, from afar. Uh, but it is good to have many different influences and, and try to mish and mash the best parts of each influence into your own work. And that's how style, unique style or individual style comes from anyway, is from just kind of the mish and mash of many different artists that you really enjoy and then having that come out in your own work. What was your question, Tobias? Can you just say it? <laughs> it's easier if you guys just say your questions so that way I don't have to go fish for them. And then we'll take Oscar's question and then uh, or you can just rewrite it right now. Copy paste it. Whatever is faster. Because I don't think I can hear you. I think you were having mic issues before. Um, I have another question after Oscar and Tobias. Okay. Tobias? Oh, is it better to specialize or be a generalist? Um, uh, so I, I kind of answered this question earlier, right? I said to somebody, you know, it's best to, to uh, be a jack of all trades, but a master of one. And the reason why you should specialize first and foremost is because you will get um, really good results much faster. And you'll be amongst the better artists or the better people in the industry. If you think of it like this, imagine that this is a time frame. And in that time frame, you, you train your skills in these three different things, A, B, and C. And in that same time frame, there's an artist who trained themselves in one of these things, C, in the same amount of time, okay? And that's the amount of skill. It also equates to how much skill they have. Now, yes those who are looking for people who can do A 
if they had options between you two, then you'd probably be a better candidate, right? And if they had to choose people that do stuff like B, then again, you would be the better candidate. But when it comes to C, there is no contest, right? You, you are going to be destroyed by the specialist, okay? That makes sense? So you're thinking, okay, well, then in, in generalist terms, I'll have a good chance overall, right? Um, no, because the specialists work on the big and baddest projects, right? And so if you think of it like what I'm saying is that you're also going to be competing against specialists in those other fields as well. Do you see what I'm saying? Like it's not like you're only going to be competing against other generalists and you're going to be gauged amongst other generalists. You're going to be gauged against everybody. And that's including people who specialize in that one thing. And where generalists make the most sense and where they fit the best is where companies that have smaller budgets or smaller studios, maybe they don't have small budgets, maybe they have a lot of budget, but smaller studios that are trying to really get a lot of real estate out of their artists or, or studios that generally um, have a generalist mentality to their workflow. Uh, and there are big companies that are like that, like Supercell is like that. They have really, really small teams comparative to like their, the amount of money they make. And then they, uh, what you call it, they have like um, the guys at Valve, same thing. So it's not like that it doesn't exist. And I think they actively are looking for people who can do multiple things really, really well. All right, so it's not like um, that it's, it's like I said, like with the Shadi and um, the, what you call it, Shadi and Marco Djurjevic example, like those two guys are great examples uh, of extreme excellence in each facet and they both exist in this world you know same thing there's there's a world where generalists rule too in the industry but you have to figure out where they exist but specializing what's great about that is that you can always fall back to your specialization you know and you can always rely on that one thing where if you're a jack of all trades you're, you're always going to have to rely on working for companies that need people like a, a jack of all trades does it make sense to you? I'm just going to assume yes. Okay, cool. And then Oscar, go ahead and ask your question. Uh, so the thing is, uh, I'm going to take a class with a... Uh, uh, of characters for animation with a Pixar teacher oh, cool. and I want to learn uh, who's the teacher Nate Wag oh, okay I don't know him <laughs> I didn't know him either uh, but uh, I wonder if you can give me some tips for to practice a uh, more expression on characters because this class I'm going to have it by the end of this month so I have plenty of time to practice and get ready for that class mm -hmm. so that's yeah. it yeah um, the the way that I would say you should go about that is uh, start to do um, studies and practice paintings that involve exactly what you just said like more expression like get really good at painting characters that are full of life. You know, it says character design on the description of this course, but the reality is I'm more just like a mentor, right? And and character design is what we happen to be using as a tool to learn about art and life. Um, but uh, character design for animation like means character in the actual word of character, meaning the person's character. Like if they're a smart person versus an angry, like that kind of stuff matters tremendously in animation. Um, yes. In, in the world of film and game, not so much sometimes, especially in games, like where you're just creating a character that is just going to get shot and murdered every five seconds. You know, there's no reason to kind of build a backstory around that, right? Um, they just got to look like something fun to shoot. You know, and there's other characters that exist in, in this industry that only look cool, even if they are in the narrative and a little more valued in the narrative. And so, but with animation, yeah, you really want to hit upon, like, the character part of character, 
okay? And I would say practice that by like painting characters and then seeing if they actually make people laugh or interested in it or anything. Like they get like some sort of emotional reaction to it, not just a, oh, that's a cool drawing, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, because that's what the, that kind of character design environment looks for. Mm. That game. All right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Next question. I think we have one more, and then I'm gonna call it a day. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. I think it was me. You go for it. Yeah. Um. So my question is just. I think you mentioned earlier how like. Um, like our generation, we have like a lot more resources on the internet, uh -huh. and in terms of like how to learn and stuff on um, anything really. How do you filter through out like what you would like call like misleading information or like you know things that like would actually be more detrimental to your growth? Rather, like how do you how do you judge for yourself? If you don't if you don't know any better like in that field sure. or even. So this this, this is a great question. And I have a great answer for you. All right? You ready? And we're going to outro after this. This is a, lot, a great question to end on. The answer to this question is, um, is something that I've kind of been alluding to continuously, which is focus. Okay? All right? So you, you're getting at, like, how do I know what to look at? There's so much information. Uh, what do I know when I'm looking at good stuff versus bad stuff? And I'm telling you, just stay focused, okay? And what I mean by that is that if you want to be a character concept designer that could work for the likes of Blizzard Cinematics, then do everything in your power to learn you, all the tools to make you that happen. If your attitude is, uh, I want to just work in the industry, then you're going to hate your career. All right? But if your attitude is, I'm going to really kind of focus in on this one thing and just be the best at it, you will have a lot more control over your career and have a bigger opportunity of loving it, too. Okay? Mm -hmm. And laser focus allows you to weed out those types of things that are just not necessarily useful. For instance, ZBrush 4R8 came out. I have ZBrush, but I have not touched it. I haven't tried the new tools because right now my focus is game development, not ZBrush sculpting. Do you understand me? I see. It's a great tool. It's a great thing to use. In fact, there's a lot of good information. It's very. The problem isn't which is bad. The problem is which one did I choose, right? And, and that's what I'm trying to tell you. There's actually quite more great information out there than there's bad. But what you got to do is treat things like a scientist, right? So what a scientist does with data is they average it out. That's what statistics are for. Statistics help you see the broader picture. So if you only heard from Shadi Safadi, everything he said to you would and could lead to a career, right? Mm-hmm. But like I mentioned before, he's wrong, right? So is that detrimental if you got a career doing something? No, you might have just been misled to a career that you didn't necessarily want. And that's not to say that what you want, don't want, is not what someone else want, doesn't want either, right? Someone else, mm -hmm. like artist Z, might love the Shadi Safadi approach and love their career once they get there, you know? That's absolutely true. But perhaps because you didn't know, like I want like you if you would have just said I want to paint everything and be a concept artist in that regard, then you would have been so confused by what Shadi Safadi would have been saying, right? Like many people have. And that's why I'm saying gather lots and lots of data and just stay focused. Cause Shadi's not wrong, but try to figure out why he isn't wrong. Because he, clearly he makes money and he makes a good living. You know? And other, many other artists do the same kind of process, and they do great, and they make a great living too. So there's, there's clearly, you know what I mean? There's clearly more information to, to be had, and you just don't have all the information yet. I do, so that's why I'm telling you that he's wrong, right? I know because I've met thousands of artists. I know artists from all sorts of fields. 
you know, the, the, here's a here's a, another great example of being misled if you're not paying attention. ArtStation. I love ArtStation, man. ArtStation is like godsend for concept artists. Okay? Right. Oh, look at it. People like my work, too. Dope. It's great, right? Mm -hmm. Great opportunity. You know, and one time they asked me for some feedback. They say, what do you think we should do to improve the website? And I said, you guys need to have more animation artwork highlighted more often. Mm. Because people are under the impression that this is the only kind of stuff that exists, right? Super high, detailed, realistic, overly fantasized, over militarized designs, you know? Right. Because ultimately, like, it's hard to see. It's like you don't really see a lot of these design in the in games, like these overly or like. Oh no, they, they exist. Yeah. They they do, and they're they're actually quite a quite a uh, prominent in the Asian market. Okay. But do you see what I'm saying? Like that's the point I'm trying to make. Yeah. It's just because yeah. you don't see it doesn't mean it's not true. Right. You understand? Like you have to you have to really understand that your assumptions almost entirely are wrong about everything, okay? And that's why you have to dig to be sure that you're wrong, you know? You know? Yeah. Because uh, it's one thing, like, for instance, someone on the on our Discord was complaining about Transformers ruining the, the franchise of the movie industry. And she's, in their, one of their complaints was mentioning that perhaps it's bad because, you know, the Asian market is highly influencing Hollywood. But guess what? The Asian market is paying the bills for Hollywood. Transformers, I think, commercially actually flopped. The latest one, it mm -hmm. commercially flopped here in the States. Yeah. But fucking murdered overseas. So you bet your ass they're going to keep putting those freaking Chinese soda pops in their goddamn movies. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's just how it is. It's the world. Like, there, you, you, people need to understand that there's a whole other side to a coin, you know? Mm -hmm. And... What I'm trying to get at is like, so when you go to ArtStation and you think this is what concept art is, if I don't do something like this, and I actually tell people go to ArtStation all the time because there's a lot of great inf information to be valued there. But then I tell people, you know, if you go, if you only go to ArtStation, you might think that there's only one kind of art that exists in the industry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's why I don't use ArtStation actually is my main driver of influence for my own artwork. I use it as a place to see who's great. Like I'm like, mm -hmm. who who's the who's some good artist, man? I wanna figure figure out who those are, right? Yeah. But this is where I go to learn something about what I can add to my own artwork. Make sense? Because Pinterest is not unilateral like that. It is diverse, the kind of things mm -hmm. you can go. You can have like these super mechanical space engine parts and gifts floating around here, right? You're not going to find that on our station. You know? You can go from there to, like, workout tips. <laughs> you know? And it'll give you, like, some, like, inspirational how to say bye-bye to your love handles. <laughs> you know? And then this will, you know, will lead to more of the same information, and you'll find more tutorials on how to strengthen your inner thighs <laughs> right and yeah. on the on the flip side you can go from that to looking at like exotic foods right yeah. and you may think that well what, what does exotic foods have to do with concept art what if I use this as a color palette, homie? Mm -hmm. All right? Yeah. What if I use this as my photo texture for some sort of boiling of a skin on a character that I'm designing? Right? Well, some, balsamic, yeah, some balsamic roasted pigs <laughs> with honey is what I use as my texture for the boils of some sort of character monster that I've designed. Like, look at this. This looks disgusting in the context of what I just said. <laughs> yeah, right? it is. Well, I'm sure this is delicious. Things are amazing. 
<laughs> you know? And so that's why I don't live on ArtStation as my only driving force of inspiration for that reason and that reason alone. Um, because it's just, it's, it's misleading. There's more to concept art in the industry, right? Mm -hmm. There's all kinds of art in all different fields. Have you ever gone to Behance? Yeah, I, I've been on there once in a while. Yeah, I mean, on a like, too. this is, Behance to me is the equivalent of ArtStation when it comes to graphic design and motion design. Yeah. Does it make sense? Like, yeah. this is what it looks like to live in, in a very specific motion design aesthetic, okay, and, and a, a graphic design aesthetic. There's no concept art here. There's very few, if any, right? Right. And it's not to say that ArtStation doesn't have motion design. They actually do. Let's do the graphic design. Let's see what we can find. Yeah, see, they have some people that do icon and graphic design stuff. Mm -hmm. But people don't come here for that, okay? And so you got to know where you're at, you know what I mean? You got to know where you're, you're, where you're swimming. Um, here, here's, a, here's a really fun way of thinking about this, too. I'm going to give you two examples about, like, perception and versus reality, okay? And then mm -hmm. I'm going to end the class on this. i, I got to get going. Class is way beyond... <laughs> I'm way over. Um, so there was this uh, in in World War Two. There was this like this problem that they're they're having with a lot of the jets or the the fighter jets weren't coming back, and they're trying to figure out a way to solve this problem. You know, they're trying to find a way to to make more and more come back safely, and so they were looking at where all the the parts of the the plane were being attacked at, right? Where all the parts were there was the most damage and they were trying to find, okay, if we can reinforce these areas where the jets are being just like shot at the most, uh, we'll probably increase the chances of them returning. Right. And so they did that and it did not work. The, the same amount of people were still not coming back and, and dying or being, the jets were being abandoned. Right. Out of sea. So they're like, what? Like, we're not thinking about this, right? What did we miss? You know? And then someone basically decided that the way, the reason why they were wrong was not because um, of the bullet hole stuff. Like, they, they were right to suspect maybe where things were getting shot. That's a good place to start. It's just the way that they thought about it was wrong. They should have considered where the planes weren't getting shot. You see the, you see the kind of the, the point, yeah? Because the one, places where they're not being shot proves that they're, that, can bring them back to the base, <laughs> okay? These jets that have came back, yes, they have bullet holes all over, but where do they not have bullet holes? Because apparently right. that's what made them come back. So, so, so they re they inversed what they reinforced, exactly. They inversed the things that reinforced, not the places that had bullet holes, the places that didn't. So they reinforced those areas, and then sure enough, more jets came back. Do you get my point? Yeah. So on the surface, it seems like, yeah, that makes sense, right? But the more you think about it, the, the, the more that reality will kind of like smack you in the face. It's like, no, that's not exactly the, the case. You need, more, you need more data, right? And uh, that's what I always encourage my students is like whenever they hear conflicting advice or conflicting, um, you know, insight, get, just get more data. Like listen to more people talk about the same types of things. See what other people have to say about this 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 thing. I was watching a, a talk with a guy saying that all advice is bad advice, and he also recognized the irony of his talk because he was giving advice about not giving a, taking advice. Yeah. And I was just like, he like, should you listen to him or not? <laughs> he he's he's young and naive. That's the way I thought about it because that's that's just clearly not true. Because just think of any instance that that could be disproven. Here's some here's a good example. Don't stick your head underwater for more than 10 to 15 minutes. That's, I think that's some good advice. <laughs> so I don't know what he's talking about. Some advice, <laughs> all advice is bad advice. You know, don't put your hand on a, on a stove. You, you'll get burnt. That's pretty yeah. good advice. That's good advice. Yeah, that's pretty solid, <laughs> right? 
So, so, I, but I understood where he was coming from. So I, I didn't completely discount what he was saying. He, he was trying to put some context. He says like, maybe what made you successful isn't going to make everybody else successful. And that I agree with. That makes right. sense. That yeah. has some truth. And that's something that I learned the hard way. And that's what I'll tell you guys some other day, you know? Um, mm -hmm. and that's why I'm a much better teacher now than I was in the past because of this revelation. Okay. And mm -hmm. so, and just to kind of hint on what I mean by this is that a lot of teachers sometimes blame the students for the lack of effort. Mm -hmm. But isn't it better to say that, isn't it better as a teacher to inspire those who are the most uninspired to actually do their work versus the people that are already motivated? It's easy already to teach the people that are already there. You know, people that are already like ready to go, work their asses off. It's actually very easy to teach and help those people. Yeah. Wouldn't it be a better attribute of a teacher if they can get the people that can't do shit, that don't want to do shit, to all of a sudden start doing stuff? That's what happened to me. That, that was a revelation that I discovered, you know? And that's yeah. when I went from only 10 to 15% of my students doing their homework every class to pretty much 85 to 90% of my students doing their homework every class. Okay? And so get more data is what mm -hmm. I'm trying to get. That's the moral of the story here, all right? You know, always get more data. Don't don't assume anything, right? Always just assume. Always assume, guys, that you're just absolutely dead wrong unless proven otherwise, okay? Uh, you're, you'll be safer in that world, okay? Because if you're proven wrong and they put evidence in front of you, then you can objectively and justifiably be like, yep, my bad, right? Versus someone who thinks that they're absolutely right. And you and everybody thinks that the, they're better than this, but trust me, everybody is like this. So it's, it's really it takes some real good practice to not do this, including myself. Like I'm real, I'm serious. Like everybody has this problem of really believing what they believe. Okay, mm -hmm. and so it's really important to back it up with data. Uh, I've been wrong before, and I'll be wrong again. This is how it works. Yeah. And so um, more information, more data. That's how scientists roll, and that's why scientists can put spaceships into the sky, okay? And so uh, use the most reliable tools that actually yield consistent results. And so uh, and you'll start to see improvement in your own work quicker and better and better. Anyway. Thank you. Yeah, yeah man. That's, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, when it comes down to it, guys... Um, I appreciate you guys' hard effort and hard work. You just got to just keep at it, you know. Uh, and I actually encourage people. I, I'd rather people work consistently than hard, meaning that I'd rather you, like, be painting every day, all day. No, I'm sorry, not every day, all day. Every day consistently, at least for a few hours a day, than all day for only a few weeks at a time then completely burn out and stop doing it for several months, <laughs> okay? I'd prefer the, the, the first alternative. And it's really important that you guys understand that that's really what it comes down to. Um, with that being said, I'm going to bounce out. I'll let you guys go, too, and enjoy you guys' weekend. Thanks again for doing all the good work in class. Keep in touch with one another. Help each other stay on task. And with that, I'm rolling out. Peace out, friends. Take it easy. See you guys soon. Thank you for watching this video. I appreciate it. Please subscribe to watch more in the future. If you like the video, I would appreciate a thumbs up. If you like this content, you can go to my website, robotpencil.net, where you can find mentorships, tutorials, and a Patreon to get more exclusive content. Thanks again, and I'll see you guys in my next videos.